So my name is Tara Simrich, and I am the artist who created the Coexistence exhibit at the Leighton Art Center. I was inspired to do this particular exhibit for a few reasons. First off being that a few years ago, I had created an image of a magpie. And when that magpie was portrayed in the public, there was really visceral reactions to this particular subject matter. People liked the way it was painted, but they just had really strong feelings about magpies, be it because of their noise or because they can be predatory. And there was the odd person that just absolutely loved magpies. So people were very black and white in terms of how they reacted to that particular painting. So that combined with the fact that I'm also an environmental scientist and I think about how people interact with different wildlife species, particularly in an urban setting, uh, made me decide to do an entire body of work. The paintings are named according to the animal's scientific name. And also I, tried to think of species that I often get asked about. So family and friends will often ask, you know, how do I get this flicker out of my insulation? It's driving me crazy. Um, how do I get this? Who should I call about this skunk under my porch? And even though wildlife is not necessarily my area of expertise, just being an environmental person, people tend to ask me a lot of questions about that type of thing. I decided to do a bunch of different critters, as I called them, that I typically either hear a lot about of people not coexisting well with them, a lot of high conflict species for these particular two walls. Um, so the idea of a flicker destroying people's siding or waking people up as they're tapping on the metal above their chimney, um, the mouse is just a very obvious one. People don't generally like to have mice dwelling inside their houses or sheds and all the mess that they tend to bring in with them. In terms of the beaver, we have uh, a species that we typically tend to think of as destructive. So all the trees that are getting cut down that you enjoy having around your pond in your neighborhood. But at the same token, looking at the other side of the coin, beavers are actually very important to the ecosystem. They provide a lot of benefits to the water storage system into the water quality system. And so a lot of scientists are actually doing a lot of research about encouraging beavers into certain areas for these reasons, which kind of um, goes against what we tend to think of as this species we don't really want around our homes. So for the other critter wall, uh, I also decided to do a snowshoe hair. And the reason I wanted to do the hair was uh, that I felt the conflict went both ways for that particular species. So while there's the classic kind of Beatrix Potter, Peter Rabbit eating the garden kind of scenario, people hate when the rabbits are constantly chewing down their flowers into their gardens and that type of thing. The conflict also goes both ways because oftentimes people pick up the baby rabbits that have been left behind by the mother, thinking that they're doing a good thing, thinking that they've been neglected or abandoned and they bring them into veterinary offices or to wildlife rehabilitation places. But really the mother knew what she was doing. She left that rabbit there safe in a spot where she could find it again. Um, and so that's really detrimental to um, the hares. Um, I enjoyed using my typewriter a lot for this particular exhibit. So if you look very closely at the hair, you'll see within the piece, there are a lot of scientific facts about the hair, um, as well as a few kind of more common ways people like to describe them. The squirrel is particularly hard to live with in my, in my neighborhood. It's very personal in terms of the conflict. They are constantly eating Christmas lights. They've eaten my tree. They're into things. And my neighbors have spent countless dollars trying to get them out of their insulation and out of their roofs. But a lot of people also enjoy watching the squirrels. So while I also incorporated some of the Chiogami, which is a hand silk screened a paper, Japanese paper that I enjoy using for most of my mixed media work, I also put peanuts in because that's not something that the squirrel would find in the wild. It's something that people are, are feeding to the squirrels. So that idea of how we're coexisting and maybe not letting wild animals be wild animals. The coyote, that's another common conflict species, especially uh, if you have pets and you're in an area that is high in coyote population. Um, what we tend to forget sometimes is that when we've moved into an urban area, we've moved into an animal's habitat. And so they're very well suited to live there and they may continue to live there even with humans kind of bringing in housing and roads and all the rest of it. 
Um, for that particular piece, I brought in maps. So if you look really closely at the piece, there are maps in the rolling hills. The songbird wall was a concept that when many people were looking at the catalog, they could get right away. And that's the idea that we have these songbirds that we absolutely love cohabitating with. We love to watch them, we love to listen to them, but then we have a domestic predator um, in the form of a cat. <laughs> that, and cats are actually one of the leading human causes of death to songbirds um, or domestic anthropogenic causes. We keep cats as pets and then we let them outside. They will kill a lot of songbirds. And so the idea to have this cat looking on this wall of birds and then to have the little feather beneath was a concept that I wanted to portray, especially because as an artist, um, what I paint most is birds. So I wanted to incorporate the songbirds somehow. And the songbirds also have an anthropogenic element within the painting. There is a lot of um, decorative papers as well as uh, sheet music incorporated into the birds. So I decided to do the nest as a sculptural piece, as kind of a centerpiece to the exhibit. To me, a nest represents home. So we're coexisting with wildlife within where we live. And the idea that there are adaptations that need to take place as well. So the idea that a bird will build a nest out of natural elements, but that they'll also incorporate anthropogenic elements within it. So we often find things like Kleenex or um, yarn or hair if we examine a bird's nest really closely. And so within this giant nest that I've created for the centerpiece, I have incorporated willow and I built it out of chicken wire. But then you, if you look closely, you'll see brightly colored ribbons and flyers and the insides of cassette tapes that have been all woven in to kind of represent that coexistence. So I also decided to incorporate insects into the exhibit uh, because that's also a lot of people have very visceral feelings about insects. So the bumblebee tends to be something that people can cohabitate with quite well. So instead I chose to do a wasp and I have woven anthropogenic elements throughout every single one of the pieces. And so in the wasp piece, I decided to put a glass bottle. So that idea that you're at this backyard picnic and the wasps have showed up and if you take a drink that imagine and getting stung is kind of where people go with wasps. The house spider has had some really interesting reactions to it since the online catalog was released. Some people can't even look at the painting is what they've told me because they have such terrible memories of living in a basement suite with this particular species, which is actually called a house spider. So some, and then some people are really, um, conflicted. They'll say, I really love the painting of the wasp, but I hate wasps. So it's interesting to see if somebody would actually put a piece of art like that in their home. Uh, one of the leading causes of owl death is rodenticide. So it's something that as humans, we're, we're not trying to kill owls, but through our actions um, is something that ends up happening. We are trying to get rid of rodents. We feed them rodenticide. It's an easy way to get rid of them. But we're, when we're not thinking about the entire food web, what we're, we're not realizing is that owls, getting an easy snack, are gonna get poisoned, and then we're killing a species that we maybe didn't necessarily intend to get rid of. Um, so this owl has um, also those typewriter uh, pages within it, uh, scientific facts about the owl, as well as a few kind of descriptive terms that we use. Um, the props were super fun to make for this as well. Um, got to make up my own brand of rodenticide, which was really fun. And then the other one is a diseased owl that I had a beautiful image that I was given permission to use of a barn owl. So while we don't have barn owls in Alberta per se, I wanted to use this specific owl species because I had such beautiful reference imaging for it. And if you look closely at the diseased owl, he's got the halo to signify that he's passed on, but within the lighter parts of the owl, you can see there are names of different um, common rodenticides that are used. Um, and oftentimes when they find a diseased owl, even if it's diseased for another reason, they'll often find levels of rodenticide within that owl's body. So just something to make people think. 
So the printmaking wall was really fun to make. Um, I enjoy printmaking and thought it would be a great idea because I really wanted numbers for this particular piece. I wanted people to understand the dynamic between skunks and what they eat because while skunks are typically a species that people do not like coexisting with in an urban setting, they actually get rid of a lot of pests that we also really don't like. So the skunk is named according to its scientific name, Day, and then I enjoyed making a play on words with what the skunk eats. So the bed bug is called bedtime snack because skunks do eat bed bugs. They also eat mice. So that is an a mouse bouche. And then the um, ants we labeled as a, a refresh mat um, in order to kind of give the idea that they're what the skunks eat. If you look at the left-hand side of the wall, there are fewer skunks and a lot more critters or what they eat. And then on this side of the wall, we have more skunks and less of those kind of undesirable insects and rodents. So the magpie was actually the first piece that I painted for the exhibit. And while it had been inspired by that initial story of having painted that magpie years ago and people responding to it in different ways, one of the reasons I also wanted to do this particular piece was that when I was collecting information for the exhibit and researching, I reached out to the Alberta Institute of Wildlife Conservation. And they were fantastic. They gave me a lot of statistics and common species that I could use that they're constantly rehabilitating because there's so many human conflicts with them. But one story that stuck out in my mind that they told me was of a magpie. And it was a magpie that someone had found injured and brought into their home and put in a cage. So this injured magpie is not getting medical attention, but they're feeding it. They feel like they're doing the right thing. And meantime, the magpie's family is actually calling to it. And what I learned was that magpies actually mate for life and so they are bonded. So having this magpie kind of suffering in a cage in someone's house, despite the good intentions, was not actually a good thing. And when an animal gets too domesticated, it can then not be rehabilitated by some of these great organizations because they only rehabilitate to put back into the wild. So if they're too domesticated and they're injured, they often get euthanized, which is against what someone who means to do well is trying to do. So the magpie, again, I personally like magpies. They're related to crows and ravens. They're very intelligent birds, but they get a really bad reputation. So again, with the typewriter, there's a lot of facts in there, but there's a lot of names that people like to call magpies. And people often think that magpies are black and white, but they actually have a lot of blues and greens and iridescent colors that come out if you look at them closely in the sunlight. So the idea of having the cage of, you know, it's not necessarily just about adapting to each other, but it's also about letting wild animals be wild animals, even when we're coexisting with them in an urban landscape. I came into making this body of work uh, wanting people to have an emotional response to the animals that they were seeing on the walls and to examine their own prejudices um, or visceral responses to certain images that they saw in order to really examine why is it that I feel um, scared, upset, angry, uncomfortable when I look at this particular species and think about why is that? Is that because of cultural reasons? Is it because of a personal experience? Is it because of a story that I've heard? Um, and then maybe give it a little bit more thought because of seeing that animal in a more creative light, in an art piece, maybe being able to back up and seeing it a little bit differently when they encounter that animal outdoors as well.